Um, I've been in this hall many times and sometimes the acoustics are not quite 100%, so let's hope it works well this evening. Welcome to everybody, thanks for coming on this miserable, damp evening. I'm Bill Newton Dunn and I've got the important job of really introducing Catherine and just explaining what, what this is all about. So this is a, a community conversation, this is an opportunity for the residents and the voters of North Richmond and South Richmond wards to give us hell, ask questions, express opinions, interact, whatever, as long as you've come here for that and not for a movie or a talk about something completely different. Um, so we've got a, a, a small program. Um, first of all, I ought to introduce perhaps the panel, rather like any questions or something. So starting in no particular order, but on my left, Peter Buckwell. Well, we've got all names in front of us, haven't we? Pam Fleming, so you can see that. I'll come back to Castle in a moment. Nancy Baldwin there. Richard Pine and I think Richard Warren at the front. Hi, Richard, down there. Very good. And we've also got some other councillors here. We've got Alex Eamon there, who's going to perform in a minute and do his thing. And somewhere, the leader of the council, Gareth. Oh, there he is. Oh, he's, he's acting as a lusher as well. That's very good. Thank you very much. And we've got two more councillors here who are out of ward, but incredibly welcome to this area. We won't ask for your passport, so I think welcome to come. <laughs> no, so that, that's, that's who we are. Um, I've got to explain where the fire exits are. As far as I know, they're over there and over that side, the way we came in. So if the building suddenly starts to burn, uh, we'll take whichever exit isn't burning and um, see you outside, I guess. Now, the important part is to introduce Catherine, who's going to be the impartial, very fair chair of the whole thing. And we exchanged emails this morning, so I got exactly the right things to say about her, because she's extremely well known, everybody knows her already. But she is the director of Richmond CBS, <coughs> which is a charity which supports other charities, voluntary and community groups in the borough. Catherine joined the organization in 2009 as health and partnerships manager, and has been in her current role as director since February last year. As director, she focuses on providing leadership for the voluntary community sector and championing its role in the borough, as well as maintaining strong links with partners, including the council and clinical commissioning group. Catherine has worked in the voluntary sector for 20 years at the national, regional, and local level. And she's always keen to help facilitate constructive dialogue and effective communication to achieve positive results. And that's what you're going to do now. I hope so. And welcome, Catherine. Over thank, to you. Thank you very much, and good evening, everyone. And welcome to RAC. Um, I'm delighted to be chairing uh, this community conversation this evening, because actually the office of Richmond CVS is based within the RAC building. We're right up on the top floor, um, and we do work in partnership with the college on a number of the areas of work that we cover. So just briefly to talk about Richmond CVS for a moment, um, as we've heard it's a, a charity that supports other charities in the borough. We have um, in excess of 750 voluntary and community groups in the borough. It's an awful lot of work that goes on on a voluntary level. And what Richmond CVS does is to support those groups to achieve more. So how do we help them? We help them by providing them with support and advice around obtaining funding, making sure their organisations run effectively. Uh, we also help to give voluntary groups a voice and make sure that they can take part in activities in the borough and help make Richmond the great place it is to live and work. Um, another key area that we cover is volunteering, because as you may or may not know, um, voluntary <coughs> groups rely heavily on volunteers in order to do what they do. So we run a scheme to recruit um, volunteers and match them up with organisations that are looking for volunteers. Um, and uh, one area of volunteering that's particularly important for the borough is around trustees. They're the people that, as most of you probably know, but they're the people who sort of um, are responsible for the strategic direction of charities and help ensure that they run effectively. And it just so happens that in two weeks' time, um, in fact, very much at this time, uh, next in two weeks, on um, Thursday, uh, there will be a trustee recruitment event 
you may have seen a flyer as you walked in, and I can't resist doing a plug for this because if uh, you're thinking about being a trustee or know someone who might be interested in being a trustee, our recruitment evening on the 15th will be an excellent opportunity to find out more about it. So do please feel free to pick up a leaflet on your way out. You can also contact us if you're interested to know more about volunteering or you're connected with a voluntary group and feel that you might benefit from support that we can give you. So that's my little pitch for Richmond CVS. Do please feel free to come and talk to me at the end if you want to know any more. Um, in terms of my role this evening as independent chair, I think I've got two main tasks. One is to help field the questions when we get to that point, um, and the other one is to keep everyone to time. So uh, I, I shall be trying to do that to the best of my abilities. A couple of points to note. Um, this evening is being uh, recorded. Um, it's only the panel that are being filmed, so you don't have to worry about being on camera. That's our own sort of trauma here. Um, but you, um, if you have a question that you want to ask, if you're given a microphone, please wait for the microphone to reach you. And then when you have it, please hold it like you're eating an ice cream. And you hold it fairly near your mouth so uh, that the sound's captured properly. Uh, because it's important that uh, council officers later know what, what's been said and are able to capture all the conversations. Um, I think most of you will have signed in when you arrived. If you haven't signed in at all, please um, do that on your way out because it's uh, nice to know who's here and also means you'll be able to hear um, about further things that are going to happen in terms of the community conversations. Um, we're particularly keen to sort of, uh, well the council are keen to see how these run and Richmond CVS is always very keen to ensure that there is healthy dialogue going, al going on so we're very keen to hear views as well um, about how these events can evolve and make sure people feel they can have their say. So we're going to start off this evening with a short presentation regarding the 20 miles per hour um, uh, proposal uh, and then there'll be some questions on that. We'll then move to the pre-submitted questions, some questions that have been sent in in advance um, and the panel will respond to those and then um, after that we'll then open it up for other further questions. So uh, that's the plan for this evening and as we've been told we're going to finish definitely by <coughs> 9 o'clock. So now I think I think I've covered everything. As I say, I will be keeping people to time, so uh, I don't uh, think I'm being rude if I do at some point have to move things along. I'm under strict instructions, but I'm now going to hand over to Councillor Eamon to uh, talk about the 20 mile per hour proposal. Thanks very much. Um, I hope that I can be heard. Um, so it's a this is the first time we've given a presentation. This is the second event that we've done of this nature and we've decided to incorporate a presentation because I think some of the questions that have come up at the previous session um, we can potentially tackle head on as part of this but don't let that stop you of course from uh, raising any points that relate to this. So first of all, just to, I'm not going to read every slide because I think that kind of defeats the point of PowerPoint if it indeed has one, but um, the, the point really is to say that if you haven't received your documents through the post and you're not totally clear about exactly what it is we're proposing, it's that we introduce a 20 mile an hour speed limit across the entire borough, excluding only the roads that are directly managed by Transport for London. And I just want to say a quick bit about why we've, why we've done that. Why didn't we just, for example, only do residential roads, which is a frequent point which comes up. And there are four points. First of all is that safety, and I can take up points on this from questions. The majority of the accidents that take place, the accidents, injuries, uh, and fatalities, sadly, that take place on our road network actually tend to take place on the the larger, more arterial roads in our network. So to just reduce speed on uh, residential roads we don't feel would have had enough impact in terms of uh, improving uh, road safety. Simplicity, you don't get this, some roads are 20, some roads are 30, you're not quite sure about what's going on. Savings, uh, I can answer some more on this later but the key factor here is that uh, this is this is cheaper than delivering a uh, 20 mile an hour speed limit that only affects some roads. Uh, about one and a half million to do that on residential roads whereas because of the simplicity of signage <coughs> and various other things yeah, it's about half the cost about seven hundred thousand pounds give or take to deliver this scheme it's straightforward because one of the issues that we we recognize would have come about is that <coughs> wherever we drew the line some residents would have said well we'd rather our road was included in the 20 mile an hour speed limit and some would say well you've included our road we'd like to come out and you end up in this uh, potentially ever ever never ending uh, debate about which roads should be in and out there's a there's a there's a sort of 
uh, a wonderful sort of simplicity to 20 MPH across the whole borough, which, which, which obviously puts pay to that sort of um, discussion. <clears throat> I won't go on this in, in great detail, but I think the key thing to point out is that um, we're, in a bad, we're in a bad situation, actually, uh, as a borough. Uh, we've got road accidents and we've got uh, casualties increasing in this borough. Um, and I just draw your attention to um, the, the two bullet points below, whereas in outer London over 16, 17, there was an overall 2% reduction in casualties. In, in our borough, we saw a 2% increase. Um, and th those are figures up there which uh, focus on casualties, but we could show you figures on, on accidents and all sorts of things. So the story is not a good one. We shouldn't be complacent. It's not as though we've got a wonderful record uh, on road safety in the borough, and we do need to take some action. <clears throat> I'm not going to take you through all of this, but one of the arguments that we're making is that financially this makes sense. So I, I've, I've cited some of the cost of doing this, but actually if we take the cost of slight accidents that we had in the borough over the last year, uh, and we get a moderate reduction as a result of this 20 MPH of 6%, which would be 26, broadly speaking what we're saying is we get pretty darn close to actually uh, delivering the cost of this scheme in terms of overall cost to police, uh, ambulance services and, and wider uh, civil society, all paid for of course by the taxpayer. So we're actually, we're actually making savings uh, longer term if we reduce the number of incidents that take place on our road. That's not to mention some of the bigger ticket items like fatalities which you'll see from below have even greater cost implications. <clears throat> this is just a bit of context. This shows where 20 MPH in borough terms at least exists partially or fully. Uh, the darker shaded areas are uh, pretty much a full or, or, or near full adoption of 20 MPH across the entire borough. To put it differently, this map shows um, uh, in, in most stark terms where the green areas are at 20 MPH uh, and where purple is uh, you have these higher speeds. So you can see it's not the case that Richmond is some sort of pathfinder council in this regard. It's happening in, in lots of places across London. So what did these other places find? I think one of the key things, I'm happy to answer questions on this, is in all of these places, and I'll touch on this later, we, we did see a sort of one to two mile per hour reduction in overall speeds. And that might seem to some of you a little bit like, well, I thought there was a 10 mile an hour speed limit difference between 30 and 20. But what we, what we see is even for a one mile per hour reduction, we get a 5% reduction in accidents. So a 1 to 2 mile per hour speed reduction is going to save lives, is going to reduce uh, casualties, is going to reduce accident levels. So we're not being idealistic here, we're not basing everything on everybody's doing 30 at the moment, tomorrow they're all going to do 20, but these boroughs have found overall average reductions. <clears throat> these are just figures which show um, some of the uh, survival incidents in relation to uh, royal um, Royal Society of Prevention of Accidents figures in terms of fatalities at 30 versus 20. Um, what, what some of the other local authority, what another local authority saw in the case of Brighton, um, and some University of Westminster figure on injury injury data. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into this because this is some um, dense sort of text. But what it what it shows is a, a Bristol study where they implemented 20 MPH and they they actually estimated some very, very substantial cost savings uh, which they uh, uh, got from fatalities, injuries, and, and those slight collisions. Um, but I can go into some more strong examples. Ultimately, we've, what we do see in examples like Bristol and Edinburgh were good increases in, in modal shift uh, to walking and cycling as well, which I'll briefly touch on. One of the key things I want to touch on, because it came up in the previous session, was that um, uh, we don't expect journey times to be particularly adversely affected by this change either. One of the findings of um, uh, data that's out there is that about two-thirds of car journeys in London uh, are less than five kilometres in length. And indeed one-third of those, one, not one-third of those, one-third of the journeys uh, are fewer than uh, two kilometres. So you'll see from the data, if you do the, the maths, you're talking about over a five-kilometre distance, uh, a three-minute difference in time, over a two kilometre distance, roughly a one minute difference in, in overall travel time. Uh, and indeed that story doesn't tell the full picture because of course this is all assuming that you're able to travel continuously for 30 miles an hour on your entire journey, which as you will all know uh, is not possible sadly, uh, uh, or, or possibly uh, positively in the borough. And the average driving speed is actually indeed 16.5 miles per hour across London. <clears throat> 
So this really just narrates the point I made earlier about the one to two mile per hour reduction, which is to say our aspiration here, you know, we're not being over idealistic. We're not expecting uh, complete compliance with the rules as we don't have complete compliance with the present 30 mile an hour speed limit. What we are hoping for is an overall reduction in speed and therefore a reduction in accidents, uh, casualties and fatalities. <clears throat> One brief note on air quality, because we, we believe very much that this will contribute to improvements in air quality, and some people have made various arguments that actually it will be deleterious. Um, there's plenty of evidence out there that shows that when you reduce speeds, it also reduces those harmful emissions. It absolutely reduces um, fine particulate matter, PM2.5 and PM10, or which come from braking and acceleration. They basically break dust and tire dust, so the faster you're going, the more you have to generate of that. Um, and the other key thing here is that it promotes a modal shift. When the, when the streets become less hostile to cyclists and to walkers, um, people tend to walk and they cycle more. Um, so the biggest impact on air quality is actually the modal shift that ensues from making our roads less hostile places. <clears throat> So uh, there's also this uh, recent study that came out by the UK Noise Association, which shows that actually if you reduce those speed levels, you can get actually very significant noise reductions as well for our area. So it's basically improving, improving our streetscape. Uh, and more broadly, as, as I referred to earlier, there's a, uh, a significant increase in cycling to schools in the Edinburgh example, where they introduced 20 MPH. One example that frequently gets cited to us is Bath and North East Somerset. This is supposedly the study that proves that 20 MPH is dreadful and harms everybody. Uh, and I, have, I hate to say it, but it's broadly it's nonsense. There's a lot of political bickering between Liberal Democrat and Conservative administrations, but I, I won't go there too hard tonight. We've got a mixed panel. Um, but what, what, what did happen was they introduced a zone, which is fundamentally, or a series of zones, which is fundamentally different. And it meant that actually there was acceleration and deceleration. There were specific issues in terms of road design and people's considerations of the correct speed to be doing. And so I don't see it as a direct comparison with the proposal that we're, we're putting out here. And indeed, there is a swathe of, of data from other areas that show that these um, speed limits are much more effective. So that's it. That's my really quick counter, because I've been told I had to be fast. Um, so it's really open to questions from, from the floor. Thank you. Start the questions. We start with the gentleman in the front row. Thank you. Um, you mentioned at the start of your conversation um, roads managed by TFL. I, I didn't know what that meant, and <coughs> perhaps lots of people here don't know what that means. Yeah. Like, say, the Lower Ball Lake Road, is that managed by TFL or Q Road? So I think from memory there are two red route roads in the borough, and that's the A316 and the A205, what's on my head? That's Is correct. The A205 it's a Q Road. Uh, well, that was the last it does, it's it? Yeah, it's the South Circular, and the, the South Circular and the Chertsey Road, the A316, those are both managed by Transport for London. They're the major arterial routes for transport. Oh, the South, the South Circular? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Make our way up. We go to the gentleman who's got his hand up there, Ellie. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I want to start by talking about cycling. Um, I, I go off to Putney quite regularly. Uh, I've got on the river there on the, on the bay houses. I go to Ealing to get the train to work now and then. My family in Twickenham is my, my kind of journey. So I'm not going to break any records. I'm not going to be really like for any time soon. But I use it to get around the borough um, better than the car when it makes sense to do so. This is the last thing I want. I would, I would much rather traffic past me got the hell down the road, frankly. Um, I don't want to have cars and buses and trucks sat on my rear wheel, following me, close following me, trying to get past it. Two mile an hour more than I'm doing. I can just see it being a nightmare. It's, it's going to force cars and bikes more closely together, more of the time. It's going to lead to more conflict on the roads. And so that's the last thing we need, you know, it's like the one of us there already. You know, any, anyone who's been out on the roads today has seen how, how bad it can be. Anger, aggression, frustration, people passing and trying to overtake, etc., etc. It's just... The cycle's not going to be any good at all. Okay, well, my feedback to that is, I mean, that's an interesting perspective. I would say um, the Richmond Cycling Campaign uh, support this, uh, support this move, as I think did London Cycling Campaign. Um, and as I said, the evidence from other places that have implemented 20 limits 
have seen that people who aren't cyclists, so who don't presently self-define as cyclists, get onto bikes and travel. So um, I, I would urge you to, I, I understand the point you're concerned about, but I think in, 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 in actual fact where these, where these zones have been introduced, these limits have been introduced, um, actually it's made the road environment less hostile for cyclists, not more. I know we've got one just up there, the blue shirt. Yeah, when I uh, first saw the consultation document, I thought, well, I think I'm in favour of that because I've often thought that people travel too fast at least around the neck of the woods that I live in. Then the mathematician in me, by my first degree, took over when I started reading the consultation document um, because, like, many consultations it buys towards the outcome it desires. And so I went online and then read all the counterpoint arguments from places like Bath and Manchester and they're equally abusive in their use of statistics. If you ever want a good example of lies, damn lies and statistics, this is a topic to, to exemplify it. Um, I finally found a pretty good resource that I think does an excellent job of properly analysing the historic data and I suggest that people go and read it. It's the Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents 2017 fact sheet, published just under a year ago, so it's got lots of recent data in it. Uh, it's well presented, the statistics are correct, and the conclusions are unbiased. Although naturally, as you just might expect, they conclude that reducing speeds to 20 miles an hour um, do help save lives somewhat. You need to be clear, and that presentation you had had a mixture of these misleading statistics about whether you're talking about 20 mile an hour zones. I, I was talking purely about limits. All these figures are about limits. Well, but was the, were the examples from other cities just about zones or limits? I think you'll find there were a mix. Uh, the only example I gave of a zone was Bath. Br well, That's as far as I'm aware. Bristol? Uh, Bristol is limits. So I would suggest that people do read it and I can summarise it for you. It says that 20 miles an hour does indeed save lives, and we're all for that. 20 mile an hour zones, that is where the limit is self-imposed by traffic calming measures, um, humps, chicanes, narrowing of roads, changing the, the street scenery, uh, has a pretty material impact. Just imposing 20 mile an hour limits on its own, speed limits like signage alone, doesn't have as much of a statistical impact. But it is a lot cheaper. The Edinburgh example, in fact, it was a factor of six across a pretty big city just to put up signs compared to actually put in the road calming measures that would uh, significantly shift the uh, outcome in the right direction. My final point is if you actually go to the end of the Rosper document, you will read that they consider that a blanket imposition of signage alone across um, a town or a city is not the right way to do it. And I think I agree with that, um, because it's just too clumsy a measure. And I think you're being disingenuous, if I may say so, when you quote the costs. Because your consultation says this is essentially free to the Richmond taxpayer, because you're getting funding from elsewhere. Mm -hmm. You are advocating putting in signage only compared to proper traffic zones, and saying, well, that saves £700,000. It's half as costly. That's, that's £700,000 you're saving off something you're not planning to spend. OK, so, there's a lot of points there, some, so, but some, but some of which, some of which I, 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 I take some common cause with you on, some of which I don't. So your last point I, 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 I do have to uh, defer from. The figure I presented in terms of 1.5 million versus 700,000, that had nothing to do with zones, nothing to do with traffic calming measures. That no, had, I'm not arguing. Uh, no, it, it, no, but you, you but cited the difference. The, yeah, the, the difference separate, in the figure... The, the, di points. the difference in the figure... Yeah, I'm just making this point. The difference in the figure was limit for limit, just different scope. So it's twice as expensive to have basically, for want of a better expression, half the scope. Uh, because you have to put up variable signage and you have to take consideration. So it's more expensive. So that was the point I was making about that. It had nothing to do with physical traffic calming measures. Now your point about zones versus limits, you're absolutely right. We've been very studious in not citing examples of zones because zones are physical traffic calming measures. And so the examples I cited here in support of our proposal are all limits. The only example I gave that differed was the Bath example, which is often used as a reason why we shouldn't do 20 mile an hour speed limits, and I'm challenging the fact that that was a zone approach. 
Now you're right to say, you're absolutely right to say, broadly speaking, if you take a, uh, a traffic engineering approach, you can reduce speeds further than you can from purely from signage. And if those calming measures are uh, enforcement activity or if they're physical engineering works, those will have a greater impact on speed reductions. What I've presented today, uh, I feel very strongly about, is that even without enforcement, any greater levels of enforcement than we presently have for 30 MPH, and even without engineering enhancements, the evidence shows where 20 MPH limits have been implemented, you can at least get one to two mile per hour speed limits on average of reductions in, in tra travel times and speeds of vehicles. And that has a, a consumer impact on accidents, casualties and fatalities, which I think is a, is a very good yield for a relatively modest expenditure. Your point about the spend, I mean, we said it's at zero cost to the taxpayer because it is at zero cost to the taxpayer. It's largely funded through Transport for London uh, uh, money, which we, we bid for and which supports the Mayor of London's Vision Zero aim, which is about reducing fatalities on our roads. So it has a very strong correlation with, with the Mayor's agenda. Well, ultimately it's all taxpayer money, but let's not go there. Um, so, just one just further one thing to add to the point. gentleman's point here. You talked about enforcement, yep. and I'm all for that. But well, I do back sure, the proposal, sure. I just don't back it in its current form because I think it's too crude, the borough I think. Um, is there going to be enforcement of it? And of course, there will be, and by the way, I also cycle, um, there will be two groups of people charging down Queen's Road and Church Road at commuting time in the morning. There will be um, people doing 20 miles an hour and having set their cruise control to it. And there will be people on, um, some people on two wheels who will greatly exceed that. Uh, with impunity because it's not an offence to exceed okay. 20 miles an hour in a non-motorised vehicle. Okay, so general enforcement, quick answer is um, the police enforce, the police are the enforcers of the speed limits. And the police, the, look, look, I'm, not making, I'm not here to defend the police, the police make the judgments they make about their resources. They will enforce the 20 mile an hour speed limit the same way they enforce the 30 mile an hour speed limit. We have made specific proposals about involving the public if, we, if they support 20 MPH in going out and using the community road watch scheme to try and focus on areas. We will evaluate the impact of 20 MPH if we implement it and we may have to take further action to try and reduce speeds further if, if there's proven to be some issues with it. But, um, and in relation to cyclists, I do think this is a bit of a misnomer. The average speed, I think, in the Tour de France is, is lower than 20 MPH. So the idea that cyclists are, are travelling everywhere across the borough at 20 MPH is frankly absurd. No, but I've heard it elsewhere. I've heard it made elsewhere. I gave up the microphone because I said, well, just so people are clear, you cannot, the police can't enforce. The police can enforce a 20 mph. The police, no, that, that's uh, for a non motorised vehicle, but they can enforce 20 mph. Well, they can't really enforce much against uh, a bicycle, it has to be said anyway, because you don't have licensing, you don't have things that you can trace people back with, so it's somewhat different. Thank you. Perhaps that's something that could be checked about the police's role in that. Can I just check, as, as, as chairperson, does any of the other panel want to come in on any of the other the points made so far? Just to check. No, no other views to add at that point. Right, lovely. Next question. Lady in the, the purple top. Um, well, first of all, thank you for a very clear and I thought convincing presentation. Um, I'm a cyclist too. I'm quite a timid cyclist, so at the moment I just cycle on shared use pavements because I find most of the roads in the borough are too frightening um, and I disagree completely with the previous cyclist. I mean, I, I would really welcome this. I find it very intimidating um, and particularly when people come up behind you at great speed and then you, they break frantically and kind of swerve around you, that's very intimidating um, and I certainly would feel emboldened to cycle more on the roads if the speed limits were lower um, and in my wildest dreams 20 miles an hour on my bike is um, <laughs> something I don't think I'll ever achieve. No thank you and I th you know we don't see this as a silver bullet for, for people who want to cycle but I think it, it just does contribute to making that that, that street environment less hostile um, and I just really worried, I heard some I heard some cat calls and moans. I think the lady here actually said she cycles on shared use pavement so that's where it's actually specifically set aside for both bicycles and for pedestrians and it's not that you're cycling on pedestrian footway thanks good to hear it next question As, um, lady the gentleman up there that's very kind of you and then yes the, 
Hello, can I just ask about buses? Um, have you consulted TfL buses? Um, presumably a bus driver is going to be required to drive at 20 miles an hour, not the sort of 27, 28 miles an hour expecting everybody else to drive at. And has the impact on journey times been modelled? So, for example, if I get on 65 at Richmond, how much longer is it going to take to get to Kingston? So, it's one of the reasons I brought up the figure about car journey times. Now, admittedly, the, the bus's length of journey is greater than, than a typical car journey time, but breaking down, the impact that we believe uh, that it will have on overall journey times of any vehicle is extremely modest, not least because you know, it, it's very, very infrequent in this borough that vehicles of any type are actually reaching 30 miles an hour for any great length of time. On your specific question about engagement, we've engaged with TfL. TfL support 20 mph in the borough. So, so that goes for them at, 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 uh, for all of the operation. We will continue to have a dialogue with the, with the bus providers and others if there are issues. We'll, we'll look at them. But I haven't had any correspondence to date that has signaled to me any issues. Uh, and what I would say is all these other boroughs, all these other places I showed you, they have buses running through them and there hasn't been, to the best of my knowledge, any impact on bus service. But, well, I, I do quite a lot of work for London Underground. Um, the, the slower a train or a bus is moving, the more buses you need for the, the same service. Yeah, but um, the point I'm, the point I'm making is I'm not sure there's any real impact, I mean, on, on the bus network, because the average speeds that are, the amount of time, I, I don't know, but the amount of time that an average bus in our borough is achieving 30 miles per hour, I think would be a very small amount. But that's indeed. where they tend to, to pick up on delays, if you see what I mean. And there are stretches on the mm. 65 where they definitely do do 30 miles an hour. Well, I think the bigger issue with buses is the recent consultation that got announced is that actually uh, bus frequencies are likely to reduce in a number of cases because TfL are under very significant funding uh, pressures. So, um, uh, frankly, in bus terms, I'm much more concerned about what's going on to the overall provision of the bus service than I am. I don't think this measure, and I'm very happy to be pulled back in front of you if we implement it, it has an impact, but I'm, I'm, I have absolute confidence this is not going to have a disruptive impact on, on bus routes. Thank you. Lady at the back. Thank you. Um, I'm very supportive of this change. I live on Church Road and I find at night people tend to whiz down it. So if this helps slow people down, then I think it's a great, great change. So thank you. Thank you. Let's go over to the side of the room. Will you be erecting the 50 metre repeater signs necessary to enforce the limit? We will do what is legally required. If, if this consultation puts us in a position to be able to implement 20 MPH as we propose, then we will do what's legally required, including that. And we'll also be looking at roundels on the ground where appropriate to. Uh, what's, uh, how will you go about ensuring that these signs are erected consistently at the right heights, centre-lined on the posts, etc.? With an excellent cadre of council officers. <laughs> You're more optimistic about that than I am. I am very optimistic about it. I can tell you I will be holding the, the, that side of our operation to account if we do. Hi. You, the argument so far has been towards 30 versus 20. There's at least one road you're proposing that is currently 40 that you're proposing to bring back to 20. Is that right? Uh, since we include all roads that are in Richmond Borough's cover, then yes. Is that sensible, do you think? A big drop from 40, which is completely safe on the stretch I'm talking about, between Kingston Bridge and Hampton Court. Mm -hmm. okay. well, uh, it's, it's 40 up as far as the buildings start, which is broadly in line with, I think, what the government are allowing you to do within your remit. Uh, within our remit, we, we have this power. So this is no sort of, you know, this is no shady sort of activity. This is very clear, and as I pointed out from the figures, there are plenty of London boroughs that have done this. Um, what, reduced from 40 to 20? I, I'm, sure, I'm sure it's happened. Um, I, what, I I would say, what, I would say is, uh, what I would say is I wouldn't have proposed this without, without being in favour of it. So the answer to your question is yes. Uh, I am in favour of it, that is why, and I suspect, um, sadly we didn't have the information today, but my instinct is, and I may be wrong, but my instinct is, and we will have at future meetings of these community conversations, we're hoping to have some data that shows where, where the accidents and injuries occur, 
And I'm, I feel pretty certain that on that 40 mile an hour stretch, there'll be a pretty heavy concentration of accidents and injuries. Not true. Okay, well, we'll see. There's also a section of the 308, which is up in Hampton, that is camera controlled at 30. It was 20 for a while, and it's reverted back to 30. So there must have been some logic there. Well, it might have been, it, it, it. it might have been, it was fundamentally surrounded with roads of the rule 30. It won't be under this proposal, and that makes the case a lot more straightforward. Okay, well, I. I just, I'm not against no, it, sure, but I'm sure. just like the gentleman up here, yeah, totally against yeah. the extreme nature of I don't think it is extreme. I, I would countenance, I would argue against that point. I made the, the rationale for why we've, we've approached it in this way uh, with those four points. The, the challenge against sort of leaving roads out would always be the arbitrariness of those decisions. And I dare say people would argue with us about what you've left in and what you've left out, and this road should be in and this road should be out. And we could end up in a public debate like Brexit that lasts for years and not do anything. So my personal view is that, you know, better for us to move in a direction that is clear, consistent, gives certainty to the motorist, and improves road safety uniformly across the borough. The only tool you have in your bag is a hammer. Every problem looks like a nail. I, I wouldn't say that, but... Gentleman in the suit there. Um, I was going to say that I was initially sceptical of this idea, but actually I gave it a lot of thought, and I thought about how in Richmond Park the speed limit came down from 30 to 20, and no one's really blinked about that. It seems like a very good idea. And I think it really shows, actually, having seen the presentation, an awful lot of joined-up thinking here, because you, you want, you're right, in my opinion, you're going to get more cyclists out on the road, um, more people concerned about uh, traffic, you know, in general as a result uh, because of that. And I, I think overall it's going to succeed if you can keep in mind that and the gentleman made a point which I sort of agree with, which is cyclists do tend to think the road is theirs um, and Richmond Park kind of bears that out. Um, and that is something where you're going to get support. If you can just say something about how it's going to address cyclists who want to speed as well, I think you will bring people with you. Uh, uh, so I can't, I can't promise the... Um, I, I take the points. I can't promise the unpromisable because enforcement lies with the police. What I will say is this, for those of you who have concerns around cyclists, and I heard the, I heard the sort of ooh and ah about cycling on the pavements, and I, I was at a Richmond Society event only a little over a week ago where that came up. Uh, I would say the less hostile we make the road environment, the more likely that people are going to be in the road environment. So I would say I have some degree of confidence that we'll see an improvement in that particular issue from the 20 MPH as well. So, I mean, all, all well made points, so, so thank you. I've got a couple of hands that came up in the middle of the room, so if we go to three. I actually mentioned Brexit. Um, if the public returns a no vote to 20 miles per hour, will the council make a commitment now to be bound by that outcome? Uh, no, I'm not going to make that a commitment here because what, I'm, what I've said all along through this process is we'll see what the result shows. We'll then look at it because it's not just about a yes, no. There are a whole series of questions that have been asked about where people think it works, whether it will affect their ability or uh, their willingness to take to bicycles and walking. We need to analyse that and then we'll reach a judgment. What I would say to you is this. It would be a very bold, maybe some might even say stupid administration that didn't listen to the will of the public, but that's as far as I'm willing to go today. Would you be kind enough to pass the mic behind you? Thank you. The, there have been a few um, comments about the uh, validity of some of the information that's been presented, and, and one observation that I've got to make is that I think your statistics include injuries and fatalities in Richmond Park, which is, of course, already 20 miles an hour. Now, I think, in fairness, that ought to be removed out of the data that's being presented here. If that's the case, and I'm not sure it is, I'll take that away. I'll go and talk to officers about it. Um, if that is the case, I'm happy to pull that out. I'm personally not sure it would overall change the picture of what's happened over the last few years but very happy to look at that. On the point about uh, sort of bias, all I simply say is this, because it's come up a few times, I think it would be very odd for me as a politician who went into the last election arguing for a 20 MPH across the borough, exactly on all the roads that we are consulting on, to have, uh, to have not made the case for the thing that we wanted to do. And I think very importantly, I've got to make a party political point here. 
but we said we would do it. Now, what we've done is we've consulted on it. We haven't just done it, we haven't imposed it on everybody in the borough. We're actually willing to listen, we want to see what people think about it and whether we proceed and how we proceed. I think that's the right way to run an administration and I'm very proud of the way that we've done it. A, a consultation means that people need to be able to make a fair decision and if the information isn't presented fairly, if it is presented in a biased way, then it's not really... I, I'm, all I'd say, Stephen, is uh, last time I think your administration ran a consultation of this nature was probably on Heathrow expansion. I don't think you made the arguments for Heathrow expansion in your consultation document. Thank you very much. But we have got your promise that you'll look at the data again. So. No, I'm very clear about it. We're in favour of this. No, we're no, in no, favour no. of it. By all means, look at third-party data, Absolutely. but we're in favour of it. Absolutely. But when you're saying that the injuries and fatalities have increased in the area, some of those are, without shadow of a doubt, in Richmond Park. As I said, we'll take that way and look at it. But if that changes the material, look at the data at the next session, I'll present it differently. Thank you. I have a question about speed humps. I've been working with uh, various council members over the last 10 years to try and improve the quality of the road surfaces in Richmond, particularly Richmond Hill, and uh, where we have a lot of speed humps. And I want to know that if you're going to have the 20 mile an hour limit, Imposed. Does that mean to say that all the humps will go? Because you uh, won't need them anymore. So I'd like to have an answer on that. Please. Yeah. So, so the answer is that the figures that I've uh, shared today and that I've been sharing at the various consultation events about what it would cost to implement this speed limit don't include any of that. Um, I think if it's proven that those speed, uh, those speed reduction elements like humps are unnecessary and we have the, the resource to do it, I'm very happy to look at it, but as part of these plans on this specific consultation, there are no engineering ins and there are no engineering outs. This is a signage only self-enforcing speed limit. Thank you. Next question. Any more questions? Gentlemen, yes. Uh, Nobody else who hasn't spoken yet. Right, oh, one on the side. We just take the gentleman who hasn't spoken yet and then we'll come back to you, sir. Just uh, one thing on the accidents. Uh, we have a, a large number of accidents at a crossroads near us. The speed limit in the side roads needs to be considerably lower than 20 mile an hour. And a lot of those accidents will have either taken place on the A316 with people exceeding the speed limit or in side roads where the accidents are very often um, below 10 mile an hour. So, is it, is it, okay, they're you're, you're using they're those figures. What I'm saying is those yep. figures being put together you need to know which of those accidents yep. are between 20 and 30 miles an hour to yep. make any sense. And, and that's why at the next session that we hold, we just haven't had a chance to pull it together for this session, sadly, but is we, we will have a map showing where those, those accidents take place. The advice of the officers and the council, and the, I'm looking at them now, is that these accidents are happening on major roads primarily on major roads. And let's be honest about it, even, even if the number of accidents that were taking place weren't skewed towards major roads, which I'm told it is, the severity of those accidents absolutely is. Speed is a major factor in the severity of those accidents. And your point about speed in excess of the limits, absolute fair point. But what we find is even where you introduce 20 MP, even though people will be exceeding the speed limit, who want to exceed the speed limit, they'll be at a lower, a lower level of overall speed when they're exceeding it. So, so we do improve outcomes for people who are unfortunately consequently hit in these incidents uh, by reducing the speeds, even if people are braking. Right, we're coming to the end of this section, but I know the gentleman there had his hand up. Is that the final question on this? Lovely, if we just go to... I wanted to come back on the cycling issue just briefly and then kind of segue into something else. Maybe um, finally, well, I don't know your name, but we have a kind of shared concern about traffic. Um, she's worried about drivers rushing up behind, braking at the last minute and then close passing or whatever. I'm worried about close passing and tailgating, not being given enough space. And it's not, it's not the speed that's the problem. It's driving standards. And if you look at if you look at the um, 2014 report, annual, annual report for road casualties in Britain that the DFT put out every year, they had a um, good bulletin attached to that, which went into some of the jury factors. Number one, at 45 percent, well, the factor in 45 percent of all the accidents, was failed to look. Number two, uh, I believe, was failed to judge speed, position, distance. Again, failed to look properly. And number, number three, I think, was um, breathless or careless. So the question really is, first of all, why, why are we not 
enforcing votes <coughs> to the top three when inappropriate speed number 10 on the list? So I'll, I'll answer that. So um, first of all, we're not the policing agency, so we don't have the power to enforce those elements. So that's the first point. I, you know, Political power is limited in this country. They, you know, you wouldn't want us having infinite power. We've got limited scope of power. The scope of power that extends to, to serious road safety improvement is, but, is this but measure. You could work with the police. You could do a big awareness campaign. Yeah, sure, sure. But you, we'd be asking the police to do more with still the same resource, which you is a challenge. The, the second point I'd make is you, you cite a number of examples, a number of um, criteria under which these, these accidents ensue. I can guarantee you, under all of those different examples of, you know, whether it's being distracted or whether it be whatever the other factors were, um, speed is, is a factor. If those people were going slower, the chances of the impact is reduced because they have more time to react. And secondly, if they do have the incident, they're much less likely to harm the person involved. So I still I think whatever, whatever the causality, less. speed is a material factor in the occurrence of accidents and in the severity of those incidents. Well, you're looking for a reduction of one or two miles per hour. I mean, are you saying you're going to accept being here in a year or two's time, having cars still doing 30, predominantly 30.28, say, when they limit 20? Well, let's have that debate. Let's have that, debate. let's have that debate. Let's have that debate if we get there then. Well, um, we can have a discussion about further measures. What I'd say is I fear that what you're arguing is making the best the enemy of the good. We can do something here which does have a proven consequential impact on, on average speeds of vehicles in other parts of London and elsewhere, and that has a material and proven link with the overall levels of accidents and casualties. Well, I'm, 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 going to, I'm going to draw this to a close now. 2015, Haringey went in. Last year they put in another half a million on a speed hump in traffic stop. Lewisham went in 20, 2016 or 2017, one of those two years, and now they're talking about putting an average speed camera in all their major roads. Do you think that's a good or a bad thing? I don't know, but it's more cost, again and again and again. So it's not going to be so under, it's going to be more than one and a half million anyway. The, the policy environment is a changing place. You vote for your political parties depending on what you want to see as an outcome. We went into the election saying this is what we wanted to do, we believe in it, we're consulting on it, I hope the residents will support it. Well, I think it's going to cost a lot more to get the benefits you want. Thank you very much. Now, uh, you, your hand's gone up and we were drawing it to a close. It's a very quick point. I know we've got to move on shortly. It's late. Okay, oh, and I've heard, I've heard those types of arguments. The evidence doesn't bear that out. All I do know is for, for drivers that come off the motorway, I'm one of them, 30 feels a little bit odd. 20 is going to feel a bit odd to people who've gotten used to driving at 30 for a while. But the truth of the matter is the evidence shows where 20 mph speed limits have come in, average speeds have come down. They haven't gone up, they've come down. So maybe, maybe you're, Madam, maybe you're an outlier on this, maybe, maybe you will go faster, I don't know. But most people won't. And that's, that's what I'm aiming for. I'm aiming to reduce average speed. Your statistics are really under No, I don't think there's any evidence that I'm aware of that shows that speeds, when a speed 20 mph is introduced, a speed limit's introduced, speeds go up. I haven't seen any evidence that presents that argument to me. I'd be very happy to see it if it exists, but I haven't seen it. No. Okay, thank you. I'm going to draw this to a close now. Thank you very much, Councillor Ehrman, for your comments and responses and the presentation, and thank you for participating in it. As you know, this consultation is in continuing, so there are other opportunities to engage, and I'm sure that council officers will come back on those points raised tonight where we want to check things. We are now going to move on to the pre-submitted questions. And unfortunately, I know the first uh, lady who's going to ask a question has had to leave, so I'm going to um, hand over to um, the lady next to her, I think, who's going to read a question on behalf of Drew Nicholson. I'm going to read it for Drew. Oh, right, the lady. Why are there so few public toilets in Richmond? This causes both local people and visitors a lot of anxiety. Thank you. Can I ask who on the panel would like to respond to that? Thank you, Councillor. I'm, I'm happy enough to start on that one um, because we do have a community toilet scheme uh, and that uh, the council pays a number of businesses um, to uh, provide facilities um, and uh, that has actually proved quite successful because of course it also means that people are using the businesses at the same time. Um, I think that we've also got to look at in the draft local plan um, there is guidance about the provision of public toilets 
Um, and, I, and I think in Richmond, I, I know that people are concerned, and I also know that if you want to encourage older people to come into shopping areas, um, it is important to have those uh, the, the, the to toilets. Um, there are a number around Richmond uh, themselves that the council itself provide, um, in particular in the library. Um, and I think we would all uh, like probably to see more public toilets, but it is a question of money, and they're extremely expensive to run. Um, there were a number of public toilets in Richmond, and they have been closed down um, in some cases because they were used for inappropriate behaviour as well. Um, I'm ho we're hoping there's a recently been a consultation on the old toilet block and Buclou Gardens, and we're hoping that that will open as a small cafe um, and provide toilet facilities. So, yeah, Yes, I think everybody would like to do more, but it is all a question of money, but we do recognise the importance of it. Um, very briefly, um, I'm vice chairman of one of the scrutiny committees, and my chair is Councillor Campanale sitting over there, but she's from another ward, so she's being very quiet. But this has actually been on our agenda as a, a, an item which we recognise as important and needs discussion. So we're looking at it. It's one of the links we're scrutinising. Thank you. Any, any other members of the panel got any comments to make on that? There's something uh, to follow up there. I think maybe publicity about the community toilet scheme is important as well. As a colleague pointed out to me um, earlier, RAC is actually on the community toilet scheme as well. So there are quite a few places in the borough that can um, provide that sort of facility for people in the, in the borough. But um, thank you for the question. Right, we are now moving on to William Collis. Would you like to ask a question? You got yes. Would you like to ask a question about the station and accessibility? Yes, um, North Sheen Station is a particularly um, isolated and not very easy uh, accessible station. In fact, the disabled or anyone with a, a carrier bag uh, really has trouble getting into the place. I understand that uh, home base is ready for development and it will be an opportunity for North Sheen Station to be moved into the rear of home base, whereby there would be ease of access and eventually um, perhaps a link with the London Underground. On approaching rail track, they claim it's Southwest Trains problem. On approaching Southwest Trains, they say it's rail tracks problem. Um, it really needs the council to look at the state of North Sheen Station and perhaps when this opportunity arises to look at moving uh, the station from its present location. Um, hi Mr. Collis. I live very near North Sheen Station. I know exactly what you're talking about. I know when they took the first bridge down, made it a halfway bridge, all of that. And I couldn't agree more with you that accessibility is very, very difficult. Um, in terms of making it more accessible, well, it really isn't a borough thing that we can do. We can talk to Southwest Trains. We can talk to Network Rail. However, I do think what you're saying with the uh, development, I think it's highly unlikely that we'd be able to move it into that area that you do, but we might be able to talk about how, how we can put the two together so it makes it a better, a better a more accessible uh, station for everybody because there'll be more people wanting to use it. So I do think we can continue to try to have these conversations with them, but we can't commit to anything at the moment because it's not within our gift. I'm not asking you to commit. I'm, you to uh, I'm sorry, can, I really can't hear okay, okay, that. Okay. I'm not asking you to commit to it. I'm asking you to perhaps get those organizations together to have a look at the possibility. I am very happy to have that conversation, yes. Great, thank you. The other panel members? Okay, thank you very much. That sounds like a commitment to try and start that conversation anyway, which is good. Is uh, Chris Moses in the room? No, it's 
submitted a question. Would you like to hear what his question was about? I think it uh, probably uh, might have some interest to other residents. Uh, Chris Moses was asking, would it be possible to have clearer signs or some other mechanism prohibiting HGVs from entering some of Richmond's narrow residential streets? Uh, for example, within the Alberts, many HG, J, uh, HGV drivers ignore the current small sign and later become stuck, causing damage to parked cars and presenting a general safety hazard. Can I make a point there? Yeah. Um, I got well, can you just wait to wait a little bit for the mic? Sorry. Um, a couple of years ago, I managed in consultation with the council to get our street, which is St. Paul's Road, just off uh, Q Road, signed uh, unsuitable for heavy goods vehicles. And yet, on a daily basis, we get huge trucks coming through the street, and the street is al also uh, continually used as a shortcut, a rat run from one road to the next. Yesterday, we even had a full-size coach coming down it. So, signage just doesn't work. Yes, it's back to the earlier conversation. Um, that's an that's a important point. Does anyone um, from the panel like to start the conversation about that? Well, I will, as I'm an Alberts resident. Ah. <laughs> um, I live in Hublon Road in Bachelor, where we don't have quite the same problem. Um, but but I, I, I did actually raise this um, with officers, and we did have a larger sign put up some, oh, I, I think it's probably about two or three years ago. But the real problem is persuading residents um, to ask always for smaller um, delivery vehicles, and this is this this is this is beginning to have some effect. And also, of course, the the real problem tends to be um, when you've got a high turnover of turnover of people, particularly if they're coming in from abroad, they don't always know to ask for smaller vehicles and removal vehicles. Um, but I don't think that signage is the answer. I think this is constant pressure on people to and and delivery companies to recognise and know that um, areas are unsuitable for heavy vehicles and these large vehicles um, and I'm afraid that sat-nav doesn't always help on this but I don't think that as you've heard signage is signage is really the, is really the answer. Thank you Councillor Fleming. Any other members of the panel have any views on this? No? So do you think as residents then might be able to try and encourage um, sort of delivery companies etc not to drive their heavy vehicles down? It you don't think it's... it's People aren't moving like they were. People are now doing lock conversions. So constantly, yeah. there are huge trucks coming down the roads with uh, RSJs put in people's roofs. The whole area is getting blocked up. Yeah, so a lot of building construction type work is causing the problem. I don't know if there's anything that the council can do about that. Well, they, 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 they can actually, when there is development um, with planning, if there has to be a construction management statement, and so that can be made um, as, as, a, as part of the construction management place, a statement that smaller vehicles need to be used by. Um, so there, 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 there are options there when it's when it's planning development. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, we're now going to return to William Collis. Your second question. Hello, uh, I'm the spokesman, but my neighbours are here who've been involved in this as well, so I just get put forward, it's not me. Um, the A316, the um, Lower Richmond, Lower Mortlake Road, is managed by Transport for London. Uh, over 15 years, I made a complete mess of it. There's an ill-conceived uh, cycle route, uh, maintenance is very poor, and um, Recently, they put out a notice for roadworks that uh, the council and we did not uh, know anything about. They closed the bus stop for five days. Um, the works were supposed to be completed between May and October. Well, October's gone and they still haven't arrived. Transport for London doesn't seem to uh, be able to manage normal maintenance. And uh, there are parts of the road where maintenance is shared with the borough. You have two organisations cutting grass on opposite sides of a path. It makes sense for the boroughs, not just Richmond, but all the boroughs, to take back the routine maintenance of their roads. They've moved bus stops without consultation. And one crossing in Clifford Avenue, which they installed the traffic light crossing by St Leonard's and Tangier Green, they installed 30 yards further up the road. Nobody used it, 
and they had to move it to where the council, our council, and residents asked for it to be, where it is now, and that cost £250,000 to move. Another Transport for London mistake. We really need to have the boroughs controlling those roads that go through the borough. Thank you for that. So, panel views on taking back control. Oh, yeah, I'll answer this. Uh, yeah, we, we agree with you that uh, we would be better off running it ourselves. At the moment, there is a lack of synchronisation that goes on between the council and TfL. We obviously blame them. Um, but uh, we do find that uh, it, it, they, they don't do it to a good enough standard as well. And um, there have been discussions with them. Unfortunately, they said no. Why? I'm, no, I'm not sure. I'm going to find out because I, I think maybe there could be some way of persuading them. We have to find out the reason they've said no, though, first of all. Um, but there also is another issue, and that is the financial side of things. I would have to get the budget transferred over as well. I, I don't suppose that's insurmountable, but it is something that has to be agreed. But I think the key thing is to find out why they said no and uh, to see if there's some way of persuading them to change their minds. Thank you, Councillor Warren. Are you happy with that uh, response? Excellent. Good. Great. So next question is uh, from Alice Shackleton. Is Alice in the room? Getting a sense of no. No, right. Um, so I'm going to give a summary of her question because I think, again, other people might be interested in this. Um, she, uh, Alice Shackleton says, I would be interested to find out why the council is scrapping the village planning as this seems to have been a very positive thing. What is intended to replace it and why? How much money was spent in consulting on and implementing the village planning schemes and SPDs, which we'll have to remember what that stands for. Will this now not be wasted? Will this not now be wasted? And just uh, the SPDs are supplementary planning documents. So um, uh, please can you explain the benefits of what the new uh, scheme will be that's replacing village planning? Who on the panel would like to start off on that? <laughs> well, no, but because um, just, just to roll back a bit, I mean, village planning started back in 2010 with um, the all-in-one survey, I mean, and that was what we'd called phase one, uh, when people were, were sent, uh, all households were sent a survey, and people were asked to identify the area in which they lived and their priorities for their local areas. And from that, um, instead of having wards, were drawn up 14 villages. And I suppose the reason we, we used villages um, is that people don't necessarily think they live in South Richmond or North Richmond. They will say they live in Richmond. Certainly, people who live in Ham, Petersham and Richmond Riverside will all tell you they live in, they live in Richmond. So by creating these villages, we were, we were actually creating at that stage what people, the area that people um, identified with. Um, the village plans were drawn up, um, and it also, of course, helped with the priorities to identify the pri with with that how how best to target spending. Phase two was the supplementary planning documents, and no, they certainly haven't been wasted in any way because they've all they were about sort of the physical character of the borough, um, and alongside that there was a refresh of the village plans, and so people those those supplementary planning documents have all been adopted it, 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 and now, and they're part of our planning policies. Um, with the change of administration, the, the new administration have decided not to keep the village structure but to go back to ward um ward, 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 ward structure and this um involves councillors more um but what it does still continue very much is the engagement process and after all that is the important process the engagement with residents and that's what we wanted to start in 2010 was to allow residents to have their voice and tell us what they what they want rather than the other way around so um and and i think and i hope it's this is again i we, we had this in fact we were scrutinizing the new new plans on overview and scrutiny last night um it is a pilot in the same way as we started the village planning as a pilot 
um, and I'm sure that um, if, if we got back, we would have made a phase three as well. Um, so I think it's scrutinising, and I think the, the new cab the cabinet member agrees with that, that, that um, we'll see how it works. But tonight is the first of the community, com community conversations, and as I say, but none of that um, money, I think, has, been, has, has, has actually been lost. Um, the, the total actually is 193,000, um, which was broken down then between um, British planning 305 and 572 for supplementary planning. But I think we are building on the building on the uh, engagement that's already been that has already taken place. So I don't think any of that money has has been wasted. Thank you, Councillor Fleming, for that comprehensive response. Anyone else on the panel want to add, particularly on the idea of the, the benefits of what the new scheme, the sort of the, the wards and the open town hall approach? Yeah, well, I, I think I'd just briefly add uh, that I, I think what Pamela has said is, is a very fair summary of the fact that uh, um, the old administration had a slightly different approach uh, to the development of planning um, in the borough. And we have a slightly different approach to that. And I think, uh, as Pamela says, as we were discussing last night at the, at the, at the committee that we're both members of, uh, we just need to see how this different approach that we favour is going to play out. And um, I think we'll be able to judge it much more effectively after we've had these series of conversations. But we are building very much on the plans that were developed over the course of the last few years. We've now put together a borough-wide plan and um, I think that is, uh, that's, that, that's working well at the present time. But let's just review this. We have an open mind about the matter. The only thing I would add to this is that we would like to get to talk to people on a one-to-one -one basis. We want to get to talk to people who don't normally have access, who don't necessarily, uh, they're not necessarily members of the Q Society or the Richmond Society or any society at all. They just are people who live in, in the area and pay their council taxes. And we want to hear what they have to say as well. So I think that's probably why we're trying this more personal approach. Um, we want to hear what you have to say. And as Pam said, we've not wasted any of it. And you know, it's a great beginning. So let's see what happens next. Any comments from the audience on any of that? Just down in the front. Yeah, I, I, oh, wait, wait for the mic. Uh, I have the benefit of also working for Richmond CBS alongside Catherine, as, as I work as their community involvement manager. My concern about the movement to these conversations is that some of the progress which was, take, which was made in picking up on issues for people who use health and social care, which ultimately is almost every borough resident, um, fall to the bottom of the kind of priority list and the ways in which the, um, they're engaged with because, for instance, people who use health and social care, people who are carers may have difficulty coming to meetings like this, um, people who have disabilities may have difficulty in going to meetings like this. And with the village planning um, process, it took maybe something like three or four years for the council to develop means of engaging more effectively around those kind of issues. The initial questionnaire had nothing whatsoever to do with health and social care. So it took a while to adjust. I'm keen to see this process not excluding people in the same kind of way that the village planning process did initially. I couldn't agree with you more on that. The, the whole point of this is not to exclude anyone. And if you have specific ideas about how we can improve, then we want to hear it. Because these are, it is our stated aim to talk to people who do have difficulty engaging with us. And we will go to them, and we will find out ways to do that. But if you have ideas, please, by all means, tell us. And we will listen, and we will do our very best. But it sounds like you have an idea. <laughs> Would you like to share it with us, perhaps? We've got, lots of, we've got lots of ideas, but it depends on how this kind of 
uh, process plays out, what will fit in with that best. I mean, we all we already work alongside the council on these kind of areas, but you know, it's just seeing how it would best fit in with that, and how best to try and access those communities who often are underrepresented. Well, can you and I make an agreement that we'll get together and you're going to tell me everything that you think? Okay. Absolutely. All right, it's a deal. Done. Thank you, yeah, no, no, just, 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 to, just to come back. I mean, I, I think um, the, the we did because we started. In fact, we employed the um, the community links officers, of which we have one, one of the originals still here tonight, <laughs> Lynette. Um, and in fact, they did go out very much and engage. But of course, with every, if you like. We, so we started off with a pilot with, with Barnes and Witten, um, and with every phase that we did and, and, and every charge that we did, we learned better about engaging and how people wanted to be engaged. And I think with the, um, I mean, I went and sat on sofas in Hampton Square and did all sorts of strange things, took my dogs along to events to try to get people to engage. So I, I, th I, th I think it's like everything else. It's a learning, it's a learning process. And certainly that process of engagement and making sure um, that people who don't come to meetings, um, and we went to reach out with them. We worked with RHP very closely. We worked with the various housing associations. Um, and community groups. So, so I, I think it is learning, and I'm sure we'll pick up. We've always worked with RCBS, and I mean, in fact, I think you came to all the various leaders' question times that we, we that, that we had. So I think it's fair to say that you know it, it is a learning, and mm. you know we want that to be included. Mm. Thank you. Just on a simple side, I would go and talk to you if you're sat on a sofa, Pam. <laughs> Okay, thank you for that. Right, uh, moving on. Is uh, Francis Dinnick in the room? Lovely. All right, we should just wait for the microphone and then if you can read your question or a summary of your question, that would be lovely. Thank you. Many residents on Richmond Hill are concerned about the number of basement extensions and underground developments that are being granted approval. It's well known locally that there are underground streams running down the hill beneath our homes and that some cellars and basements are prone to flooding. There's evidence that basement extensions are diverting or blocking the streams, causing the properties to flood for the first time, other properties, neighbouring properties, and putting those neighbours to considerable expense and inconvenience. The Council's strategic flood risk assessment shows which parts of the borough are at risk of groundwater flooding, based on an interpretation of the geological information. However, Richmond Hill has been completely ignored, apparently because the consultants couldn't find enough information to make a classification. Developers use this lack of information to claim that groundwater is not an issue, and the planning department turns a blind eye when considering underground developments. What pressure can our councillors bring to bear on the planning department to take this issue seriously? Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, well, Francis, hello. You and I have exchanged emails on this one, and I know there's an enormous amount to go. I, I'm on the planning committee, um, and I've been, I don't claim to be an expert in this, but I, I do know, but nobody knows where the streams are running down under Richmond Hill and I'm told that it would be very expensive, or that's the excuse we're given, to try and survey it and map them all out. And that's, I don't think that the, the, the planners in the council have ignored it. They've just said, this is a, an enormous job which we're not equipped and we haven't got the money to do. So that, you're absolutely right, and I would love to solve it. In the meantime, if anybody makes an application for any basement or whatever they want to do, uh, it comes to the council and it's open to anybody here to make an objection and then the planning committee has to, somebody's saying they can't hear me, is that right? You're over from the I'm, yeah, I, I'll sit forward, thank you very much, oh, sorry. Um, you can at any time raise an objection to any of these proposals that people are making for their basements or whatever and then it comes to the planning committee and we councillors attended and discussed these in great details and the public can come and talk to us in the planning committee which are entirely open and give us their views so we are very sensitive and we want to get this right as sitting on the committee so um, let's keep communicating and try and find a long-term solution to this in the meantime we'll deal with each case one by one okay. Can I add a couple of things here, Francis, if that's all right? First of all, basements 
generally were considered permitted development. Richmond Council has made it that they are not considered permitted development anymore, that you have to put in a full planning permission now in order for that to happen. That's the first thing. The other thing is the onus is now on the person doing the basement to prove that it is not going to cause harm. And those are parts of the papers that are going to be sent to the plan as part of the planning application. So I'm hoping that gives you a bit of comfort uh, none at all. We had one in our regular. None at all. Oh, dear. Um, and what is it that it well, particularly? Because they have because, to prove it. Because they are using the SFRA to say that there isn't a problem with groundwater flooding. Mm. But if you look at the map of susceptibility to groundwater flooding, it shows absolutely nothing for Richmond Hill. And when I asked the consultants who carried out the consultation why that was, they said there wasn't enough information on which they could form an, a classification. However, we went to a geologist who was perfectly able to see where the water, not specifically where the water would be running down, but that there are streams running down. And we have plenty of evidence from people who live nearby that there's a well in the road just down from us where you can see the water level, you can actually see it. And we showed photographs of this at the planning committee meeting and, and it was just brushed over. Um, can I, can I just come in here? Firstly, um, yes, it's absolutely true that um, until we introduced Article 4 directions that came in on, on uh, in April, um, uh, no no basements, basements were permitted development. And now they do at least have to come to the planning committee. So that does give, um, as, as Councillor Newton Dunn said, um, some, some, some opportunities for discussion um, ab about the, uh, the, the, the problems um, and, and, and the risks. It's also true that we introduced a new policy for the local plan that was adopted um, in, in Ju July, a July, a July council, um, where, where, whereby in fact um, more evidence uh, does have to be uh, submitted, um, certainly over uh, stability and how it may affect um, the risk to the neighbouring building and the existing buildings. But the, 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 the point about your question is what you're saying is your quite dissatisfied and you, you don't think that the there is adequate um, protection for Richmond for Richmond Hill and that an adequate study has been made um, about the risks uh, for the basement developments in Richmond Hill and what are your ward council is going to do about pursuing this and I, and, I, and I think this is something that we do need to pursue with environmental officers um, and certainly on the underground streams and I, I, I hear what's said uh, about their, their uh, this being an expensive exercise um, but I know that you yourselves have done a lot of research and there is quite a lot of expert evidence around and so I think at the very least what we need to have is a, a, is a discussion with um, the cabinet member and with um, environmental um, the senior environmental officers to see what more can be done to look at studying the problems and the specific problems of, of, of Richmond Hill and these underground streams because it has been going on um, for years and years and we don't really know what the impact is but the fact is that more and more people are developing basements and that I think is the problem that um, we, we need we need to take up so that as ward councillors is certainly something that we can we, we can we can look at thank you Pamela. thank you all ward councillors for South Richmond agreed on that to look at sort of how that can be fantastic thank you thank you for the question Okay, right. Now I think this is, we're getting towards the end of our submitted questions. So is Paul Brown here? No, no Paul Brown. Right. Um, his, his question, it's quite brief, was could we get an update on plans and timescales for the now demolished Meadow Hall site on Church Road, Richmond? Shall I give a quick update? Um, it's earmarked for affordable housing. Um, Basically, the, uh, we're getting it ready to, to, for marketing, to find a developer to develop it. Um, it's been in a state of disrepair and non-use for ages and ages and ages, and it was boarded up not so long ago. Um, so I really hope we can get this moving, because it's just been sitting there idle for an awful long time. And uh, it's a waste of space as it is at the moment. So hopefully we can get some homes built there soon.
Can I just give the background to that? I mean, it was it, it, um, unfortunately um, there was a planning application submitted some years ago, um, but it never reached um, a, a planning committee, or because there was a, a lot a lot of objections from residents around. Um, the subsequently um, we were asking asking for it to be demolished, and there was a quite a long delay. Um, well, subsequently, it was um, there were discussions with a, a registered uh, provider, housing association, about it, and some plans submitted. But that, in fact, didn't materialise. Um, and then, uh, yes, we did ask for it to be demolished, and it was delayed for a very long time because they discovered bats. Um, and Mr. Brown, who asked the question, um, just just by way, may know that that. Um, we were told, all advised as ward councillors, that it was going to be demolished, that they were going to remove the asbestos in, in, the, in, in August, um, complete demolish, demolition by the end of September. And I just happened to, to, to notice at the end of September, because I back it back onto it, that it hadn't been demolished. So I took it up with the officer on the Saturday, Sunday night. I happened to meet Mr. Brown as I was coming back from Richmond Station on the 1st of October. And I said to him, I've been in touch about it. It hasn't been, hasn't been demolished. And when we both got home, there they were, out demolished, demolishing it. So um, I'm absolutely delighted I, that, that, that it's been demolished. That, that's at least an eyesore gone. And um, yes, it's being marketed for affordable, to registered li ha landlords for affordable housing. Excellent. Thank you for those answers. Right. Um, the final two questions are related. So we're going to take them together if the people are here to ask them. Peter Gregory Halliwell, are you here? Fantastic. And is Chris Varley also here? Yes, right, so we're going to start with um, Peter and then before we get an answer, we'll, we'll hear from Chris because they're both on a similar theme. Thank you very much, Chairman. What measures is the Council currently implementing to ensure that all its residents recycle on a regular basis? Thank you, and then over to Chris. Yeah, um, hello. Uh, with recycling ever more in the news, um, I wonder if we could have an update from the councillors and council office officers regarding the plans regarding recycling in the borough generally, as it seems different people have different impressions of the strategy the council has and what is actually available to residents regarding recycling. This subject is very difficult to get information about. Last time I managed to get information, I was told recycling bins for blocks of flats have been stopped because Richmond's run out of capacity to deal with recycling and that individual flats no longer can have collections. And I think what this really means, without wishing to um, talk for too long, is that in many cases no recycling is done at all on an individual level unless that person goes to the trouble of taking their recycling out into local, locally zoned um, and designated recycling. Um, and it's, it's pretty... You know, it's pretty much a disincentive to recycling. I'm just putting it out there and be grateful, you know, for information, as I'm sure we all would, to pass on to everyone we know. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, okay, well, look, let me um, give you some thoughts, because I've been in discussions with uh, Gregory on the subject of, um, of recycling. But the first thing to say is that we have no statutory power to force people to recycle. Um, I think that in most terrace streets, it seems to me that about 90% of people make some effort to recycle. But there's a, you know, there's a dogmatic about 10% of people who choose not to do so. But I think if we're going to improve the recycling rate across the borough, which is stuck at 42%, it's been 42% for I think the last few years, we've got to try and get those people who don't recycle at all to participate in the recycling activity. And I think the group that we can make most progress on is people who live in flats. And um, so we've got in our ward, for example, um, Sheen Court, which is a development of 200 flats, where there are no recycling facilities um, at all. So if we, we know from talking to people there that quite a lot of the younger people particularly would like to make their effort on recycling. But so far, the managing agent for the flats has been not cooperative about it. I, I think we have to put um, those people who manage these large blocks of flats under much more pressure to make their contribution to it, not only for environmental reasons, but also for financial reasons. I think the other priority we've got to try and push much harder on is food waste. Now, the actual proportion of households, who I think, which recycle food waste is much, much lower than do paper and card. But something I hadn't realised is that food waste is actually very heavy. 
and a council is charged by weight for the amount of waste that goes into landfill, or is actually at the present time it's incinerated rather than in landfill. So I think the other drive that we really need to put emphasis on is getting more people to contribute in food waste recycling, um, because that would make a significant difference, both from a financial point of view and an environmental point of view. But to, to answer the other gentleman's question, there is the council has not run out of recycling space. There is no, we have the capacity to get recycling up very significantly from 42% um, without any threat on the council's resources. The issue is actually making it easier or making it possible for flat dwellers to make the contribution that most house dwellers already contribute to. Thank you. Anyone else from the panel want to comment on that? I know this administration does. Oh, do you want to go back there? I mean, I want to support your point because I think you make the right one. Trying to get flat owners and flat you know, occupiers to do more would make a big difference. The, pro the problem that you have is that in many blocks of flats, I, I don't know about the one you quoted, I just know about the one I live in, there is nowhere for people to have bins put out. And, in, and even though a lot of the residents go to some strenuous, strenuous efforts to walk down the road with bags and stuff to put into cardboard recycling, it's not enough, you know. And uh, I, I think maybe if there was, um, you know, I mean, I'm just making a suggestion, but, you know, bus stops, for example, if there was recycling facilities put next to a bus stop, it, people will take them out then. It's not, I don't think there's any lack of willingness it's to make it easier, as you absolutely said. If it can be an, an initiative to make it easier, and people will go and use them, absolutely. You know, I, I, that's why I'm just coming back to s support the fact that I think flats absolutely would be the way forward. Yeah, and all I would say is that we as an administration are keen to try some new approaches, because you know, recycling is done at a higher level in Wales, and in, of course in many European countries, particularly in Germany, the recycling rate achieved is about 70%. So there's a considerable scope, I think, for getting this up. And I think what we have to do is try a number of different initiatives and see what is giving us the best bang for our buck. Because at the moment, we're just stuck where we are at present. Can I just add that uh, we've currently got a food waste trial going on in two blocks of flats. Um, but May it I is a trial. And also, all waste and recycling is being reviewed next year. So we will be welcome and open to listening to lots of ideas from all members of the community um, next year. So start telling us your ideas now, please. Yes, and could I just introduce, this is Councillor Campanelli, who is the chairman of the Oversight Committee having to do with environment. So she knows of which she speaks here. <laughs> so. Jeff, thank you, Chairman. Very quick. Council Pine and I have had very good communication, I, I must agree with him. And when I, I agree that, and I understand that you can't force, quote unquote, but I know that in the neighbouring borough, which I won't name, there are actually draconian bordering on fascist in, 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 in making sure their residents do whatever, you know, they're required to do, putting stuff in the right. Are they, my question then is, are they just doing that off their own bat, as it were, with no legal, no legal basis to it. Well, I they, they are, trust me, they are doing it. Well, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I so because you know, you and I had a, a various a lively email exchange. As I understand it, there is no power. We cannot compel people to recycle. We can encourage them. We can put them under some pressure, as you know, with a, a close neighbour of yours, by me uh, putting bits of paper through the door, and I'm prepared to go further and actually knock on these people's doors and actually um, try and find out why it is so difficult for them to make that contribution. But at the present time, we have no powers to do this. And it's a slight issue that you know, the great majority of people in this borough are community-minded and make their contribution. I don't, wouldn't really want us to get the, the reputation of being sort of snooping bullies who go around and, you know, put people under undue pressure. But I, I completely sympathise with your point of view on this. Thank you. Can I just add that um, when it comes to food waste, um, South Richmond um, is the worst in the borough for recycling their food. Um, so uh, there is a lot that we can do um, in, 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 in Richmond to um, encourage more food recycling. Thank you. Gentlemen, is this on the related point? 
Oh, there's one no. behind you. Uh, if there are new ideas coming forward and new initiatives, may I make a plea that task and process are joined together? There are a number of bins around the place, these large ones on um, corners, there's one about King's Road. Make sure there's enough emptying these facilities, because there's nothing worse than going to them with a pile of cardboard to recycle to find there is no room, yep. and the bins are there, but the emptying cycle needs to be adequate, because if it becomes popular, you're going to have to put more resource into the emptying of them. Um, May I use this opportunity to also say that the temptation then is for people to say, oh, well, I'll just shove it by the end there, at which point it becomes a fly tipping problem. So yes, I think we have to look at frequency of emptying them. Any more comments from the panel on this? No. Any more comments from the audience on this? But clearly it's around, oh, no lady down here. Sorry, just caught eye. I um, quite agree with you, Nancy, and the gentleman up there about the recycling facilities. There's one drawback with that. In my ward across the borough in Hampton North, there are big waste recycling areas near the Sainsbury's, and they get really blighted. The reason being, they're only designed for people who haven't got curbside recycling, and then everybody starts using them thinking they're all entitled to it. So we need to address that and empty them more frequently, or put signage on them. Yes, I, I know that one of the pledges of this council is to be a greener council, so presumably there is a lot of um, incentive to try and uh, do as much as possible to encourage residents to recycle, make sure there is capacity to have bins, and also we need to remember to re, uh, reduce and reuse, don't we, as well as recycle. I know Councillor Baldwin has got her reusable cup there as well, so uh, I think it's important we all try and reduce the amount we have to recycle in the first place. Right, thank you for your patience. That is the end of the pre-submitted questions, and we now have some time for any other questions uh, that relate to North Richmond or South Richmond that you may wish to ask. Now is your moment. It's only just come to me, although I'm, I'm aware of it, it ha it's happened for years and years and years, and you probably can't answer the question specifically, but what happens to all the money that the borough gets from film uh, companies uh, filming in the borough. I, 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 can, I can make a small um, revelation to that, that where there's filming done on Richmond Green, which quite often is, and um, Bodyguard was the last episode was partly done on Richmond Green, some of it goes to Friends of Richmond Green for helping keep the green going, and part of it, I think, the rest goes to the council. I don't know quite how they dis decide. Yeah, how do they give me that up there in the budget? Yeah. The council gets paid for, pu for the parking suspensions, um, and the film companies tend to make a small don small donate. They make donations, which is then decided by ward councillors um, where that should go. Um, we. Um, been giving some money to, we've, we've awarded donations actually to, to Richmond Museum of Richmond and various local uh, societies. So, um, you know, it's also, of course, excellent publicity for the borough um, when there is filming, and we have a huge amount of filming on the Riverside and over in Ham. Um, so, you know, down by Ham House, I think Grandchester, a lot of the Grandchester filming has been done down there. So the borough, borough does benefit hugely. Yeah, I don't want to discourage it. I just... <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions? related North and South Richmond. I'd like to follow up on the point about the filming. I, can, can we urge the council to be more robust about this? I mean, as it's been pointed out, Richmond is extremely photogenic and very popular, very handy for studios, etc. And uh, I actually don't think it's good enough to say, well, they make a contribution to the Richmond Museum and so on. I mean, if there is a unit, I think there's a film unit, um, which should be concerned, n uh, in addition to facilitating parking and whatnot, also to really um, making it clear that the film companies must pay a considerable amount of money for the privilege of filming in Richmond, and that this could go for the benefit of Richmond as a whole. And uh, I feel that there could be more um, encouragement for, uh, for the film companies to make a bigger contribution and it to be organised on a more commercial basis. 
Um, I, I think we could arrange for um, the to, to get to have it minuted um, and get a figure from a, f a figure for you from that because I don't know what the figure. I don't know if anybody else does, knows what the figure is. That uh, and just to add, um, that. some uh, friends of mine in, in Twickenham have had um, roads blocked off. You know, considerable inconvenience. Uh, I know that a lot of the film companies on top of it in Church Street, where I often go in Twickenham, they're filming for um, ad uh, advertising, you know, Vodafone or Santander or something like that. And these companies have vast resources and they allocate, I used to work in the film industry, and uh, they allocate large sums, I mean, which are peanuts for them, to pay for facilities. I think we could be a bit more proactive on this. I would urge the council to think about it. Thank you. Just say, I just want to recognise Elizabeth, who stood for the Greens in South Richmond, and it's, it's great to see you again. And, um, and we didn't disagree on much in the campaign, I don't think. Uh, being robust, I completely agree, the more money for, for us, the better. Um, but we have to remember, I suppose, that there are other beautiful parts of London and the Thames as well. And I guess we'll ginger up our department, who sets the figure and negotiates, see if we can get any more. But it isn't the sky the limit, of course. We've got to... Bear in mind, there are other places too. Yeah. Any other questions? A question at the back. Is there a microphone that could make its way up to the gentleman up there? Do you want to pass the other one down to the to Alex in the red top? I one? noticed coming into here this evening, on this side of Park Shop, there are several broken paving stones. Also, it's ill lit on this side of Park Shop. The <laughs> lights are on the other side. A considerable trip hazard. Mm. And there are other places in Richmond where, well, the borough generally, mm -hmm. where there are quite a few broken paving stones, like North Road Q and uh, mm -hmm. parts of Teddington. Now, 40 years ago, there was, uh, in the days when John Waller was a councillor for the old Richmond Town Ward, there was a survey about broken paving stones. I suggest that uh, another one of those takes place. Uh, for a start, I think the health and safety issue is uh, more bigger uh, yes. thing now than was 40 years ago. Thank you, yes. Um, may I answer that because sadly I know more about pavements than I ever wanted to know. <laughs> the thing is, David, I mean, if you let us know where there are trip hazards, I mean, because I know all of us, absolutely all of us, walk around our wards all the time. I take pictures, I know that the officers in, in, in pavement enforcement see my name pinging through and they know it's another thing on Rally Road or Shaftesbury Road or somewhere. So as I walk around and as we all walk around, we see these things and we report them and we get them fixed as an emergency fix. But we can't be everywhere, so please, please, please let us know and we will see what we can do. We will send someone out. But the thing that's the big difference right now in terms of pavements and getting pavements done is that it's now based on need, whereas before it was kind of like a beauty pageant. If you had enough engaged people who would write in and all say, yes, please pick my road, then you would get a new pavement. And it wasn't necessarily the people who had the worst pavement. It would be the people who had the best organized neighbors who would get these things. So we've changed that. Everybody gets a score now, and the worst ones get fixed first. It does mean that not everything is going to be fixed all at the same time, but we are still making emergency repairs. Those things are still happening. In terms of lighting, let me know where that is. We've had some good success getting the lighting sorted out. I, I'm sorry, David, I can't hear you. Here, park shop for a start, I think, because public meetings are held okay. in this building and there are quite a few elderly people that attend the meetings. Okay. I myself have tripped up on the uh, uh, pavement uh, on the way out of a public meeting, and that was at Petersham, yeah. uh, the old um, Douglas House driveway. Yeah. Well, the South Richmond people are here. I'm sure they're taking notes, and they'll make sure that gets noted straight away. But as Diana, who was here earlier, mm -hmm. she had mentioned to me about lights. I got, I let the council officers know, and within a day or two, they were on. So we can do stuff. Oh, there you are, Diana. Hi. Yeah, so. the Buckwell. Did you want to say something? Yes, I'll s say a few things, if I may. Um, yes, the, the roads and pavements get inspected every every six months by, by the officers, and uh, those that uh, that uh, um, are. Um, 
in excess of what are considered to be uh, uh, trip hazard levels are, 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 are dealt with. Um, sometimes, of course, and, and I don't want to suggest that uh, this any, any, in any way mitigates the situation, sometimes a cracked pavement, it may look pretty awful, but in fact it is not um, in excess of, uh, of trip ha has, hazard uh, um, margins. So, so uh, n under those circumstances, uh, nothing will be done. But it is important that where um, it is considered that uh, a pavement is a trip hazard, that it is reported. And you can report it on the website. You can go straight onto the council website and report it. And, and I do many of these, and I know many of, many of our residents do. And it's a matter of reporting those that need being done so that it's brought to officers' attention. Thank you. And I know I'll come to you in a moment, just saying I would back up the gentleman's point about the poor lighting outside Park Shot to someone who comes out of here at night um, in the dark, especially now the clocks have gone back. It is poorly lit and it is a college that has people with additional needs and visual impairments here. So I think that's worth uh, sort of noting. So um, certainly, as, as ward councillors, we, we, we will deal with that one. We will have a look at it and, and, and address it. Thank you. Yes, definitely. Thank you. I'll go to him next. Go to, yes. There, oh, the mic, some, oh, you, you're responding to this. I'm so, okay, just one moment, sir. Um, just quickly to recap on the film question, my understanding is that we do in fact charge quite a lot of money, for, and we make a lot of money from from um, permitting filming. It's not just a donation to Richmond Green or or whatever, and the parking charges. We actually make a lot of money. So the the gentleman's original question, which was, is that money ring fenced? Um, I don't know the answer to, but I think we can look into that to get, get you an answer. Thank you. Right, going up to the top with the man at the back there. I must put my hand up because I'm one of the people that uh, organised our, our uh, neighbourhood um, to have our pavements re redone. Um, because I've been working for 10 years on pavements and on carriage quality, carriage uh, surface quality in Richmond Hill. Um, okay, and just taking to two points, the uh, pavements I know are, are, are fixed and they're replaced and so on and we see them cracking again and again and I go around Richmond, uh, my area and have a look and I can see they're cracked again. What I don't understand is why do we use the 50 millimeter standard paving which breaks like cardboard? I've, I've written to Marshalls, the people who supply it to you guys and say can't you develop a better product? which takes more weight because lorries drive on the pavements and I've seen some of your own council vehicles driving on there so you know we all put up our hands and, and so on but the point is this you fix the pavements and you do a great job with it but the material that is used is could be better that's just one point uh, that I want to make the second thing I want to talk, talk about is uh, the quality of the road services. I've been pushing for 10 years about the quality of the roads on Richmond Hill. I'm a cyclist. I cycle all over the world. And the quality of our roads here, in some cases, are, are pretty third world. They really are. I mean, I've ridden in India and other places. And you look at the quality of the roads there, they're great. You look at Richmond Hill, they're terrible. So I want to know, I've been working with Peter, um, for a number of years on this. I want to know what commitment the council is making to try and improve the quality of the road surfaces in our borough, in particular Richmond Hill, where I live. We are so lucky that we have the councillor Amen here, who is our transport cabinet minister. I think so, uh, he's the best person to answer th your th question. Thanks, thanks, uh, Nancy. Um, so a couple of things. I'll, I'll take away your point about the slabs. But I suspect, straightforwardly, the answer is there is standard, there is standard kind of uh, material used. Uh, and if we, increase, if we increase the thickness of the material, we might increase its resilience, but I guarantee we'll also increase the cost. So there's a question, there's a trade-off there. Maybe, maybe 50 mil has been agreed to be the, the sort of right balance between cost and in repair terms and, and the resilience it gives you, but we can, we can look at that. Um, the truth of the matter is I can't stand up here, and Peter couldn't have done before me, I don't think, but he'll no doubt have something to say about it. I can't stand up here and tell you that every pavement is a problem in this borough is going to get fixed. It's not. And I can't tell you that every surface of the road is going to get better overnight either. What, what Nancy says is absolutely right. Both of these are now being driven by need. Sadly, though, what that means is, and there are some dreadful spots in this borough, 
it means we're gonna have to deal with those first. And there are an awful lot of places that I think you and I as you know, normal, decent thinking human beings, hopefully, uh, we, we think are totally suboptimal, but they're not actually at the bottom of the pile. There's a lot of other stuff we've got to get through first. So I'd ask you to bear with us. We'll try and find ways of being more efficient and trying to do more, but right now I can't promise uh, solutions. The only, the only bit I didn't agree with you on, I have to say so, is I, I work for Tata um, in my, my day job. I've been on some dreadful Indian roads and pavements, so I don't necessarily commend Indian pavements and roads to, as our exemplar, but I take the point, we have got some problem roads. Thanks, thanks for the response. Um, I, I just want to say that working with Peter and the council has been terrific. You've got a guy there, Henry Chung, who is fantastic, wonderful person, yeah. does wonderful things for us, and is, is being terrific as far as we're concerned. So all I've been doing is pushing where I can to get the pavements improved. I know the job's been done, it's been fantastic where I am, but again, the point is about the quality of the product. And I'm just asking whether they, something else could be done. And I understand the point about, about the surfaces, uh, the road surfaces. It's a question of the need. And I think one of the other things, are just, you're absolutely right, uh, we've got some great officers, we've got, we've, we've got some good work that's gone on in the borough. What I would say is, what I think a lot of residents aren't aware of, and it's not an excuse, but is, is to re repave a road, depending on its size and so on, can sort of be anywhere between about 17,000 pounds to nearly 50,000 pounds. And if you're doing some more significant re-engineering, it can be 100 plus thousand pounds. And these are, these are vast sums of money. We found enough money in the last round where we didn't, we didn't we weren't driven primarily by response levels, of what was the pavement, the community fund. We did it on need. Uh, but I think we managed uh, overall to do one, one pavement, uh, one road repaved in every ward with a couple of extras in some cases. Uh, so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a vast sum. We, we, we're going to have to do this almost road by road at a time, and it's, it's an expensive process. Can I just make one more small point? Uh, I apologize, uh, uh, Chairman. Um, when roads are fixed, and then they're dug up by the utility company, uh, and again, I've, I've seen from experience in photographing repairs that have been done, and seeing how those repairs decline, and, and so there you've got a perfectly good road provided by your, you guys, and then someone comes along and digs it up and fills it up, fills it to their standards, I guess. Uh, the point I'm trying to make though, what are the standards you're you are imposing to those people that dig up your roads to make sure they are repaired to the right quality, the right surfaces? Because no, my Ararat good. Road, for yeah. example, is appalling. Why? Because it was dug up by a utility company that had not repaired it properly. So the owner should be on their utility company to come back. And it, and it, it, and it is. Legally right. it is. The problem is there is a lot of suboptimal reinstallation of facility uh, and, and of paving and so on. Uh, and it is a problem. It's a big problem. We don't, the people doing this work don't have the same skill levels as the right. people that we're sending out. And they do a poor job in many cases. Uh, what I would say is this is where we need you as residents. We can't do it all. We don't have eyes and ears everywhere. If you see it, I tell us about it. I and do. We can don't chase worry. it and we can get it fixed. Thank we you. can get it reinstated correctly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Buckle, did you want to say anything? Well, I, I was going to, but I think it's been pretty well covered, actually. And uh, the uh, officers have, have been looking, um, uh, over, as you know, Peter, over the last uh, uh, year or two at the quality of work that's been done. Uh, quality came up as, as, as a problem early on in, uh, I think, Stephen's uh, race. Before for, for myself um, uh, 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 in highways, and uh, it, it, it's not only a matter of inspection. You're quite right that the, the, the it's the, the standard of uh, the quality of the paving stones that they're lose, using. Um, uh, they, they, they were looking at that, and also the quality of the the it's not just the quality of the inspection, but the amount of inspection that can be carried out with the the number of officers that, they, that they've got. Um, the problem is recognised by officers, and I'm sure that uh, my successor, Councillor Eamon, will carry on the good work. Thank you. Right, we're getting towards the closing stages. We've got time for one or two questions, so uh, let's see if we can get both of these two. Are these the final two? Right, we'll see if we can get through them. Let's start with the gentleman here. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Rich the centre of Richmond is full of bollards. Some ten years ago, when I was walking along Hill Street in Richmond, I fell over, I'm a partially sighted person by the way, I fell over one of the bollards and ended in the gutter and damaged my ribs. 
I complained to the council at the time. They didn't, they weren't helpful whatsoever. So I then contacted the Royal National Institute for the Blind and they wanted details of the bollards. And they found out that those bollards in Hill Street and in other parts of Richmond do not comply with the agreements reached between the Royal National Institute for the Blind and the Department of Transport. Uh, lots of correspondence went back and forth between Richmond Council and the RNIB. Richmond Council eventually uh, said they would replace those bollards. Those bollards, over 10 years later, are still there and they are still very dangerous for elderly people and partially sighted and blind people. Okay. Can you tell me why they've never been replaced? Uh, Councillor. Councillor Buckwell, do you want to respond to that? Well, I, I must admit, um, as a ward councillor, that, that, that's actually the first time I've heard about a specific uh, um, it, um, aspect. But um, street clutter overall is a problem, both from signage and... OK, no, f fair enough. And, uh, well, we as ward councillors, we will, we will take that up and look at it for you. Um, again, um, if you can come and see me afterwards, and uh, we'll see what we can do. If, if they don't comply and they remain a problem, for part, particularly for partially sighted people, then we will take it up. Um, but the whole concept of street clutter is being looked at right the way through, up through Richmond. Um, the Richmond Town Centre um, is under study um, from a number of points of view, um, and street clutter is one of them. Thank you. Right, final question, the lady here. In a rise in Richmond of houses in multiple occupation and three bedroom houses have been developed into five, six units, what I'd like to know is why do they still only pay one council tax? Anyone on the panel like to start, uh, respond to this one? If they I, I just uh, come in. I think this is going to be looked at uh, the whole issue of houses in multiple occupation by the scrutiny committee. No, I'm not, no okay. Um, I'm not, I can't answer that question. But I think we'll have to find out for you, actually. Yeah. Um, well, 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 let, well, let me attempt. Should we, should we let. Uh, if we could. Councillor Campanelli will be. Um, in the Housing Committee Safety um, and Environment Overview and Scrutiny Committee, we did actually look at this as our last topic of the problem with or pretend, perceived problem of houses multiple occupancy. And we actually did find, discover that there was a survey done with the previous administration back in December 17. Um, and it has a very extensive map of where the HMOs are in our borough. Um, and the upshot was that we couldn't identify that this borough has a particular problem with it. We couldn't identify that we needed to implement an Article 4, and the implementation of an Article 4 would have cost £60,000, which we couldn't justify. We did consult with neighbouring um, Hounslow Borough, who have a serious problem with uh, beds in sheds type HMOs, which is a bit of a different ball game. And actually what we discovered is most of our HMOs are very well run and supervised. And the, of course, there are the odd ones that aren't, um, but that is a ward specific issue. But it's the council tax issue. Um, I have eight people living in my house. Does that make me an HMO? Family? Yes, absolutely. My three children and their three partners who've all returned from university, we're an HMO. The, the, the structure of the family is changing a lot, and you'll find that, you know. But these are best six with their own units. So you're, you're saying that, that, that as a couple living in a three bedroom house paying two and a half grand a year, the six families living next door also pay two and a half grand a year as an entity. So, so the council ta tax issue side of it is not something that we've looked at, and I agree that's a question that we should look at. I'm going to bring that back to the panel. I think Councillor Buckwell wants to come in. Yes, uh, you, you bring up a very good point. Um, HMOs, HMOs are um, a, a problem in some in some parts of the borough, and not so many in, so much in others. But the idea of the council tax is the, the council tax issue. I think is a very valid one. 
and, and, and we must certainly look at that. And um, afterwards, if you want to have a talk to me with, and, and, and tell me a little bit about, more about any specific issue you've got with that, then we, we can do so. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's right. <laughs> Would you yeah, come in on that I, one? I was just curious, um, were you thinking of someplace specific? Oh, okay. You'll need a mic. If you we haven't got any problems with the people there or anything. We just have the problem with the fact that we pay an awful lot of council tax mm -hmm. and that they are all sharing that cost and actually there's a lot of um, it's not any sort of recycling done or anything like that they are actually using a lot of council services and not really paying fairly for what okay. I consider okay. um, thank you Thank you. Right, I'm going to draw this to a close and hand over to Councillor Newton Dunn for closing remarks. But I'd just like to say thank you to you, the audience, for all your questions and comments this evening. And also thank you to the panel and to the roving mic people. I've done that myself. I know it's quite a task to run around doing the mic. So I'm going to hand over now to Councillor Newton Dunn. I, I can't possibly follow your fantastic effort of keeping us all humorous and happy and peaceful. Um, so I just want to say, I think this is a good evening. We've had an extraordinarily interesting range of topics, some of which, like council tax, we don't appear to have the answer, but we're going to look into it, and better pavements and speed limits and so on. So thank you, everybody here, for coming. Uh, I, I wish there were more here. Perhaps there was a very good program on the telly we don't know about or something, but um, thank you all for coming and for staying right the way through. A few people have slipped away. And I want to say thank you very much to the staff who have been quietly getting on making this whole thing work. Um, which has been made it a success, and thank you. Thank you to my fellow councillors. Thank you to Alex Amon. Is he still there, or is he? Oh, he's gone out at the back there. Thank you to our council leader, who's been quietly sitting in the corner over there, listening to everything, taking it all in, I hope, as well. We'll make sure he does. Uh, thank you all for coming in. And the one question I would like to ask is, if anyone has a good idea how we can get more people to come to this next time, that would be better, because there are actually thousands of voters around here who aren't here. But anyway, thank you to all of you. It's been terrifically good. And the one person I haven't yet thanked is Catherine, who's done a very good job of keeping us all under control. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'll just use the closing remarks to say two weeks' time you could be here again for our trustee recruitment evening.